break out the parade floats and whatever it is we do to celebrate now because my book, my first book, has been out for more than a year and the paperback has just come out. So for all of you people who said, I'm gonna wait for the paperback, your time has come. Cheers. This was gifted to me six years ago, seven years ago, by the very person who deletes all your comments. <laughs> This video has been brought to you by the official drink of the last 18 months. Get it? Because it's beer. Okay, so what are the most common things you get as an author is less about your own work so much as the process and how this can be applied to aspiring writers. Now that said, I don't know how helpful this will be because I definitely came in uh, deliberately so with a large platform because that's kind of I don't want to say how it's done now but it definitely doesn't hurt the title of this video is also a little bit of false advertising it would probably be more honest to say some things I wish I knew before I published my first book and also some things I kind of suspected but hoped weren't true but totally were I do kind of wish I could make these more like optimistic and inspirational than they are because I feel like every time I do a writing video like half the comments are like wow I give up <laughs> and I'm like I don't know what to tell you man it's hard I don't want to blow smoke up your ass when my mother yells at this it's because she loves me I was rooting for you we were all rooting for you yeah it's harder than you think it is if you think it's gonna be hard it's it's harder than that so I'm going to make a promise to myself that I'm not going to try to be a total downer keyword try Okay, number one, getting published is harder now than it ever has been. <sighs> I mean, it is what it is. So I think the paradox of self-publishing becoming free and creating more access is that it also created more demand because a lot of people who read a lot of books, they tend to read like mystery and romance and erotica and those genres do really well in self-publishing and people who read those genres tend to read a lot. And then, and then a lot of these people who spend a lot of time in like self-published stuff do tend sometimes to wade into traditionally published fiction. So why is it harder now than it's ever been? Well, believe it or not, demand is actually higher now, less because of the print side so much as the audiobook side, which is the fastest growing part of the publishing industry right now. And believe it or not, it is not a conflict of interest for me to use Audible as a sponsor. I was surprised about that too. So if there's more demand and self-publishing is kind of siphoning off people that maybe don't belong in traditional publishing, why is it harder now? Well, I, I can only kind of speculate, but I kind of suspect it's harder now for the same reason uh, getting a movie made, uh, at least a, you know, traditional Hollywood movie is harder now. Basically more and more resources go to fewer and fewer projects. I have seen a lot of people say that the mid-list is dying. I'm considered a mid-list author. Basically publishers will kind of go all in on a few titles per year, usually by authors you've heard of, but sometimes by debuts, especially in uh, genre fiction and YA fiction. And that kind of leaves fewer slots available. I think there's also just more supply. A lot more people are trying to get published. And really the hardest steps, the getting the agent and then actually getting published, um, those two steps are again, higher than they've ever been because there are fewer slots available and more and more people trying to get in. Number two, getting published does not mean you've made it. I mean, it means you've been published, but like that doesn't guarantee you a career. And I feel like a lot of people have this misconception that like if you get a book published once, you're in the club and you're gonna be fine. And it's not true. Uh, being an author is a constant, constant struggle. And I know very few authors where that's their only job. And the ones I do know are like, you know, John Scalzi literal millionaires who publish like 500 books. What does happen is you might get published, you might have a lot of friends and contacts in the industry, but then for whatever reason, um, maybe tastes change, the genre you write in isn't like hot anymore. Uh, just because you sold a book before to a major publisher doesn't mean you'll have an easy time from here on out. So no head? Number three, if you want something done, you've got to do it yourself because your publisher won't do it for you. 
What I mean by this is if you need research, if you need a lot of editorial assistance, if you need inspiration, they're not gonna do it for you. This really does depend on the editor. I've known of editors who um, are very hands-on and arguably take on more than they can handle, both like emotionally and in terms of workload, and they spend a lot of time with their authors just like brainstorming and workshopping. That was not my experience at all. <laughs> I get like two emails a year <laughs> with like, you know, a list of six things to change and then otherwise like, let me know when you're further along and then that's it. My editor is just very hands off. At first I was kind of surprised by that because I, I guess I did expect to be like handheld, you know, because it's like, I'm a debut, I don't know what I'm doing and they're like, <laughs> they, you know, turns out they don't really treat debuts any different than anybody else. And so the journey of my second book was very different from the first one because I sought a lot more outside help. I hired outside editors, I hired sensitivity readers, and I don't want to say like that's a big regret I have with the first book because I guess that was sort of a lesson you kind of have to learn. Um, but I feel like it really shows, like from book one to book two, like just sort of like the flow of the story and the quality of the prose, I think it shows that I had a lot more input for book two than I did book one. Which brings us to number four. It's really not a solo effort. I used to wonder, why are acknowledgements so long at the back of books? Because you, you need help. And I know that's not, like, I guess there's like, you know, those unicorns out there that like just push out a draft and then it's done and then they don't really need much help. But also I don't think they're trying to write the great American novel. You know, they're just trying to have a career, like book, moving on, next book, moving on. And yeah, but it's just like, it is, it's okay to ask for help, even though like you're gonna get shot down, especially if you're like researching and you know, you need to like reach out to someone who's an expert in something which I didn't do very much in the first book, like hardly at all, but I did a lot in the second book. Because, you know, especially like for science fiction, it's kind of embarrassing to be like, yeah, hi, lawyer friend. Uh, <laughs> mind if I use your degree that you spent many years acquiring, um, walking through the thought experiment of what uh, giving, I don't know, what the legal question of aliens in America might look like. I don't know, just, <laughs> just throwing it out there. Beta readers are, are important. I had uh, one of my closest friends slash, you know, namesake for the character was my uh, sort of cultural attache for the second protagonist in the second book. And at first I was like, eh, this doesn't matter. But honestly, like, I cannot imagine what it would have been like now writing this character without, you know, knowing someone really well and being comfortable enough with them to like message them at all hours of the night like hey uh do persians take their shoes off in the house the answer is yes turns out it's it's weird that you know uh anglo-americans don't like most mo most of the world looks down on us for that but by that same token beware of too many cooks i have definitely seen people with books that uh, especially like if they're kind of early on in their career you can kind of see where there's a lot of hands on it. Um, so it's kind of a balance and the only person who can figure it out is you. Number five, this industry is full of jealous bitches. It, it's like a disease and I do not consider myself exempt from this. Coming from YouTube, I don't see a lot of Jeal okay, I do see a lot of jealousy, but not like with people I'm friends with. <laughs> there are definitely some some jealous haters out there. They see how I do it but like the people I've known and worked with for a lot of years, um, it's rare that you see like, oh, so and so has overtaken me in subs. That means I suck. Or wow, I wish I could have done that. Like I definitely see that, and it always kind of pings my like you know, tiny red flags when people kind of go into, you know, a semi-collaborative medium with that mindset. But for the most part, I feel like, at least in my little enclave of YouTube, people are pretty good at not seeing other people's successes as reflective of their own failure or lack of success. That is not always true. I have definitely known people who are just pathologically incapable of being happy for other people uh, in the YouTube community. Why can't you just be happy for me and then go home and talk behind my back later like a normal person? Every success someone else had was a reflection of their failure. But for the most part, 
you don't see that a lot on YouTube. But in publishing, I don't, it's completely different. Everybody is jealous all the time and everyone is trying so hard to pretend like that is not the case. I think it's because most people know it's kind of wrong to be, I'm sorry, envious. <laughs> Whereas envy is offensive. It's resentment over what someone else has that you lack. Like everyone kind of knows that what does and does not take off or who does and doesn't get published or who does and does not get X numbers. It isn't really a meritocracy. I would say that's way more true in publishing than in YouTube where, cause again, like bestsellers do tend to have a lot of marketing money behind them or an influencer with a YouTube channel. <laughs> and again, this doesn't apply to everybody. I definitely know of some authors that like either are just so, let's say confident that they don't experience envy or they hide it really, really well. Someone can be like a huge bestseller and still struggle with like, oh, you have the respect of your ex peers or you have ex fan base or you have more fan art or you know, someone with very little sales, but a, like a lot of networking connections, people who are like more on the uh, commercial side of things can be like, why don't I get awards nominated? Or why don't I get, you know, uh, a lot of attention on Twitter from people within the industry? You know, it's like no matter how successful you are or well keyed in you are, everyone is jealous of everyone else. And I, you know, I am no exception. Like I'll see someone like that I know and I really enjoy and I really support like right out the gate, they get a review in the New York Times and I'm like, <laughs> so happy for you. I'm really happy for you. <laughs> and I don't know why this is more in publishing than YouTube. I think part of it is, you know, because those really obvious metrics like getting a solid recommendation from a peer or, um, a review in a major outlet are like really obvious signifiers of success as opposed to like on YouTube where it's just a numbers game. Um, but also like on YouTube, it's just it, like it's a numbers game in many ways. Like, yeah, you might pull in X many views and everybody can see it, but also it's just like, okay, I put out a video onto the next one, onto the next one. You're never going to work on a YouTube video as hard as you would on a novel. I take that back. I know some people who absolutely have worked on YouTube videos as hard as they have uh, or would have on a novel. And I, and I think the key here is to know this about themselves, and most people do, and, you know, push through it. Because I think the only way to, you know, healthily live with envy is to know that's what's going on in your head and just get over it. Because there is absolutely no harm in being happy for other people. Number six, you need more practice than you think you do. I mean, that's just basically what it says on the header. I don't know if I need to clarify that. I see way too many people you know, myself, you know, six years ago included that, you know, no, they're not gonna knock it out of the park on the first try, but kind of hope they will. <laughs> and I don't really understand where this impulse or expectation from others comes from. In my case, I did see a bunch of people coming in with this expectation that because they respect my work so much on YouTube, I was gonna automatically be perfect as a novelist. And I'm like, I have been doing this for 13 years. I have had a long time to kind of refine like my timing and my voice and like the way I construct uh, arguments and narratives and editing. And also it's nonfiction. It's completely different. Oh, I, you know, I expected better from you. <laughs> and it's like, whenever I see people who you know, just become so obsessed with this idea that their first novel has to be perfect. I get it because people are like weirdly judgmental in their expectations of like what a debut novel looks like. Like you don't expect someone's first YouTube video to like be on the level with their 20th. Why would you feel the same about a book? And yet people think that way. And I think this really inhibits people. You know, in hindsight, I wish I had given myself more slack to not be perfect. But I think in general, like, I, I think more people need to stop trying to be perfect and just accept it's your first try. I mean, no book is gonna ever be perfect, but your first one, it's still your first one. <laughs> Cut yourself some slack. Number seven, review bombing. I hoped I was being paranoid. 
<laughs> I hoped people wouldn't actually do this, but you know, jealous haters, they absolutely did. So when I say review bombing, I don't mean negative reviews. I mean like, basically like, pettily one-starring a book because uh, they hate me personally. And I really only started to notice this after someone released a video stating that um, the only reason I had ever made content criticizing JK Rowling was to promote my own book. And then a bunch of uh, his goblet, sorry, fans <laughs> then went on to places like Goodreads to, you know, mass one star the book. And I don't want to make it sound like it was like hundreds of people. It's hundreds of them here on YouTube. Maybe, maybe like a few dozen on like over Goodreads and Amazon. The rationale being that I don't disagree with JK Rowling because of a specific and uh, I, I would say a very highly articulated disagreement I have with her political views, which she has many times unambiguously made clear in public. Uh, but because I'm uh, clout chasing, I'm uh, riding the wave of JKR hate to uh, promote my own work, which tells you an awful lot about how Carl thinks. <laughs> so yeah, the point of review bombing is like definitely to bring down, you know, the, the property value of your brand, but mostly it's just to hurt you. Like it's just to, be cruel, be catty. And it's, and I don't want to make it sound like it was just Carl and his gop, his, his, his uh, followers. Like there, there was definitely some review bombing after the incident in March where for a month it was popular on lefty Twitter to, you know, <laughs> go after me. Weird how they got over that. It's weird. Yeah, it's, it's weird how I don't get like uh, threatening messages from those people anymore. You're all flops. I am the Earth Mother and you are all flops. The review bombing on the first book didn't really surprise me. What did surprise me is that they kept doing it into the second book. Like, arguably there was more review bombing on the second book than there was on the first. And that really did surprise me. Cause I kind of figured that like the first one was going to be emblematic of like all of the stuff that I, you know, unfairly accrued that I didn't deserve. And then by book two, they would have gotten bored and moved on, but egg on my face. So, and so, so the result of this, I don't want to imply that like, it's knocked like an entire star or off my cumulative, um, you know, Goodreads score or Amazon score. Uh, I, you know, it, it might have affected it a little bit, but probably it hasn't. But again, like this isn't, meant to really change the consumer's mind because, you know, if someone leaves a one-star review that like attacks me personally, you know, I think that's not really gonna dissuade someone from buying it. But since uh, Carl of Swindon has like literally just uploaded another video about me, like right before I started uh, recording this, uh, you know, I guess his, not at all creepy obsession with me is, you know, I clearly he's trying to get my attention. So let me just address that. Carl, I'm married. Um, I'm flattered, you know, and I, and I get that you've been trying really, really hard to get my attention, you know, for obvious reasons. But again, I'm married. Uh, I don't think it would really work out between us. And you know, honestly, you're a little old for me. But again, I'm flattered and I really, really, really hope that Joanne gives you the attention that you are so desperately, desperately craving. And as for Carl's fans, I'm very, very sorry I called you goblins. You're not goblins. You're trash pandas. <laughs> Number eight, imposter syndrome. It's funny, cause I can say like, I still experience envy, but I don't have imposter syndrome anywhere near on the level than I did like a year ago or even six months ago. And I don't really know why, because it was like for the first few months, like any positive feedback would just bounce right off me and any negative feedback was like, whatever hurts is true. I'm garbage, I'm a terrible writer. You know, everyone who's saying something nice is lying to me and all of the mean things are the true thing. And then I just kind of got over it. I don't know, like, again, like I don't mean this to be a humble brag, but I think part of it definitely was like, you know, making it on a few uh, best of the year lists and then being nominated for a few awards and uh, still nominated for an award. Just glad to be nominated, thank you. <laughs> 
I know that comes across as a humble brag, but the truth is that like, yeah, honestly, like validation from like, you know, institutions did kind of help me, you know, get over it. But honestly, the thing that really made me get over it was like finishing the second book and just kind of like feeling secure unto myself. Like I was like, you know, I know some people aren't gonna like the direction that I went with it, especially people who liked the first book. The tone is very different. The characters are pretty different. So I've seen people compare it to Uncut Gems. Holy shit, I'm gonna You know, I think it's like people say it's a lot darker, but I also think it's a lot funnier. Like I think it's both. I think it's a better book all around and I've seen people already who do not agree. But where a year ago, the imposter syndrome would be like, oh yes, clearly I am trash. Now I'm like, eh, whatever. You know, <laughs> like, you know, they're entitled to their opinion. I disagree with them. And I think the truth is like, I don't really feel imposter syndrome on YouTube either. Like whenever people are mean on YouTube, like I can either disagree with them or see their points. Like, you know, I've seen people be like, I can't stand your affect. I can't stand like this soul, like, wine mom above it all, I'm so tired of everything. I'm like, well, yeah, that is my brand. And if <laughs> that doesn't interest you, then I can totally see why you don't like my channel. But the thing about imposter syndrome is I do think external validation can help, but that can't fix it. I think the only thing that can fix it is knowing what you're about and just kind of creating a product that you feel secure in. And if you do that, then it won't be miserable. Because <laughs> as long as you're just like, doused in imposter syndrome, then it's just not gonna be fun. And like, what is the point of all this if like, you're not having a little bit of fun? Number eight, Goodreads is garbage. And by garbage, I mean, don't go on Goodreads. Like, <laughs> here's the thing, Goodreads is not for authors. It is not for you, it is for readers. And so unless it's like a Q&A or something, this is a conversation that you were not invited to. You know, because people have the right to have their extremely, extremely hyperbolic opinions in one direction or the other and without you like getting involved with them. And because it's really, really easy to get obsessed with. And I learned really, really early on, like before the first book even came out, like when it was still in like the arc phase that I'm just like, look, for my own mental health, I have to stay off Goodreads. So stay off Goodreads. <laughs> Anyway, I think it did a really good job at not making this a downer. Glad we, at least we still have Corona. Oh, sad. So anyway, in the US, the paperback of Axiom's End is out now. In the UK, it's been out. Uh, but they just released the hardcover in the UK just to make things extra confusing. For Truth of the Divine, the hardcover will be in both the US and the UK um, at the same time. And for all you ferners out there, Maybe one day someone will buy some foreign language rights. Again, I have no power over that at all. No, you cannot translate it. <laughs> Publisher has to buy it first. Then you can translate it. You can, tra you can work for them. Good luck out there, all you aspiring novelists, you.